So thank you all of us for coming. My name is David. I'm working with New Cypher. I don't know if you have people you have heard of us. I hope that after this talk we can you can have a better understanding of what we do and um, not only from the you know scientific perspective since we're going to get into a little bit of the detail about the serial knowledge stuff we're doing in our protocol, but also we also like to want you to know uh, what's our actually our goals of our platform and and if there's time we can show you a little a little demo of, of it. Okay, so the um, oh yeah. In case I didn't tell, I, my name is David Nunez. Uh, I work as a cryptographer for the cipher, and we come up with this super cool way to prove uh, that our pro encryption, proxy encryption protocol works correctly. And this is a, a, a very novel way uh, for the proxy encryption literature. So, first, what's the cipher? Why? 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 Why we need? Do we need the cipher? So. Basically, our, uh, the, the problem that we want to solve is when t any kind of data sharing scenario where you, uh, if there's certain information that you want to be private and, or confidential and you want to distribute it to several people, perhaps you don't know it, you don't know them beforehand, you don't know them when you encrypt the information. So um, in a typical scenario you will basically use some kind of centralized ser service where you upload your data and then hopefully this data can be encrypted with a different key for each different consumer. So that would be like the ideal situation, right? So uh, if we want end-to-end -end privacy or end-to-end -end confidentiality, we will uh, try to have the information encrypted from the, from the moment when it is produced to the moment that uh, it is consumed. This is, of course, an ideal situation, but it's problematic and it's very difficult to, to do it with uh, typical uh, cryptographic uh, primitives like symmetric encryption or uh, traditional public key encryption because there are several requirements that are kind of conflicting. So, for example, you may don't know who are the consumers be beforehand. You may don't know who are going to be the entities producing encrypted data from the beginning. Uh, you may not be available to be online to share or to grant access to other people. So there are a lot of problems that come when you only use traditional uh, cryptography. So because of the reason up to date for any kind of private data sharing service or uh, yeah, protocol, usually you will have certain centralized uh, service like a, I don't know, cloud storage server or whatever. And basically you will have to share the, the keys with them. So you have, or either share the keys with them or have a shared key with everyone, or with every potential consumer. So none of these approaches are ideal. And when you have to share your keys with the server, which is basically what is usually done, of course that you can, you can have certain point, a certain degree of confidentiality, for example, between the point-to-point -point communication. Of course, you can encrypt the files and put it on, on, I don't know, Dropbox or whatever, but then if you want to share them with another people and you don't want to share your encrypting keys, then it means you have to share the encrypting keys with the server. So the server can decrypt the data and decrypt them afterwards to, you know, to any, any, any consumer that they want. So this is, of course, this is a, a point of failure where many potential threats may arise. And basically, our, I mean, our goal is to solve this through advanced or emergent cryptographic solutions. So assuming there is a solution for this, then there are very like, cool applications that can be uh, constructed that so, for example, if there was a, you know, a primitive that allowed you to, to share encrypted information with many potential consumers, then you could construct, for example, uh, encrypted end-to-end -end chat applications where data is encrypted from the source, 
re-encrypted by some chat service or whatever, and then any potential consumer is going to be able to decrypt locally. Um, another interesting application would be to distribute content with it. So for example, uh, you could have a content distributing network mm, distributing multimedia material or whatever, and only if the consumers have paid for the, a subscription or, or something similar, then they can decrypt the service. Uh, of course, this is also an application of, uh, of this kind of ideal cryptographic solution. And we think that we have come up with, with this ideal cryptographic tool, which is proxy re-encryption. So proxy encryption has been known for, yeah, this year that's going to be 20 years, but hasn't gained uh, a lot of traction up to now. And we think that it's a really cool and useful primitive. And I'm going to briefly explain to you how proxy encryption works. So I don't know if you are um, uh, familiar with pub traditional public key encryption. I hope, I hope you are. So just briefly to, to recall that, in public key encryption there are uh, two types of keys. You have your private key and your public key and anyone can encrypt for you, for a message that only you can, can decrypt, anyone can use your public key to encrypt, but only you can use your private key to decrypt. That's cool, that it's useful for sending uh, just, you know, um, uh, if, I know, if I know my recipient beforehand, then I can use public key encryption. Uh, what proxy encryption does, it's going a little bit farther because um, it's a public key encryption scheme, but it also introduces a really cool feature, which is uh, proxy encryption allows to transform a ciphertext that has been uh, encrypted with some public key. So in this case, we can assume there is a, an encryption uh, using, with, uh, using Alice's public key, and proxy encryption allows you to transform the ciphertext into a different ciphertext that can be opened with a different private key. So it's kind of, if you have a sealed envelope and there is a way of changing the, the recipient of the envelope without, without the, you know, the entity doing this operation being able to actually learn anything about the underlying message. This is, everything is done atomically. So what do you need to make this process work? So basically what uh, proximal encryption introduces is a new kind of key called the re-encryption key. So the encryption key is something that the original owner of, the, of this data, you know, the, the one that has the private key, uh, can create a certain, a, a special key called the encryption key, which basically allows to delegate access to her encrypted information. So if Alice, is, Alice uh, creates this key and gives this key to some proxy, now this proxy can take any ciphertext that was intended for her re-encrypt it and produce a new subject that is going to be openable by Bob. So what it, this is basically doing is uh, giving us a tool to delegate access to encrypted information. So in a way, it's basically doing some kind of access control mechanism, some kind of cryptographically enforced access control mechanism. So, yeah, to, just to summarize what are the main features of proxy encryption is, first, the proxy during this service, during, during this process, the proxy doesn't learn anything. They, they uh, take a ciphertext, operate the ciphertext with the right encryption key, and the output is another ciphertext. So they don't know anything about what's the underlying message. Also, a really interesting feature, and it's uh, something that is usually not stressed enough, is that uh, all Alice or the original owner of the encrypted data doesn't have to interact anymore after delegating access. Delegating access is basically just the act of creating this encryption key and giving this key to a proxy. Okay? So she can do this, give this special encryption key to a proxy, and she can disappear. Now, there can be data producers that uh, basically are any entity that, can, that knows Alice's 
public key and encrypt information that was in, in principle intended for her, uh, but the, that the proxy can transform into any of the uh, authorized consumers that were authorized by, by Alice. Um, by the way, if you have any kind of question or whatever, please don't hesitate to interrupt me. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So basically, yeah. So basically, what what she will do is, since you want to to have, um, we are assuming that each consumer, each final recipient has a separate keeper, separate private key. So that means that Alice uh, has to create uh, one encryption key for each. Uh, for each of the recipients. So the proxy has to, you know, have. For, so in, in, in this example, for example, there are three consumers, so Alice will create three encryption keys. Because in case, for, for, imagine that she says now, I don't want the green, the green one to read my content anymore. So she only has to say, to tell the proxy, the, please remove that key, and, and that's it. Or if a new one, imagine there is now a pink, consumer, uh, she can create a new encryption key. And data, data producers doesn't have to know anything about how encryption keys are produced or, or uh, revoke or whatever. So yeah. In this pain scenario, if there's a new customer, let's say, that comes in and pays for this content, does Alice have to be online to produce that encryption yeah. key for that person? To yeah, it's for each delegation. Uh, for each access delegation operation, of course, Alice has to be online in, in, in the sense that she's granting access, so she has to authorize. So, but she's only intended to, to interact uh, only, in this, only in this moment. Yeah. And maybe you just answered it, but so Alice can create her public key secret key pair before she knows necessarily any of the destination recipient. Exactly. Everyone, everyone creates their own keepers independently, they ha don't have to know uh, each other's public keys, but Alice, Alice has to know the public key of the consumers when she wants to delegate access. So if Alice or what, well, the content producer is not Alice actually, so the, the content producer is the entity encrypting data, but uh, imagine there's uh, Alice who is the entity in control of the black. Uh, keeper. So, uh, if she wants to give access to a new, to a new consumer, she has to know his public key. Yeah, is the is the way to, to give access. I sorry, I didn't understand. The Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that could be done, but if in in principle, for for all proxy recruitment schemes that I know, that basically the only way to do that is to her sharing his private uh, her private key with the proxy, because for for yeah, I didn't I didn't explain this. Uh, when Alice creates the encryption key, she uses her private key. So her private key is the key material that um, allows her to actually perform an access delegation. So she wants, if she wants to, hand, to delegate the access delegation functionality, she has to delegate her private key. And in general, we don't want that to happen. So um, yeah, in general, it's, for us, it's like a requirement or a goal that Alice has to be online to delegate access. Yeah, because that's the way of effort enforcing that uh, Alice is actually, you know, agreeing with this access delegation, right? Oh. Yeah.
your re-encryption key? For, for each new consumer. For yeah. the recipients. But what about yeah. the people on the left hand, like all the way on the left they, hand? They all, called data producer. Yeah, they only have to know Alice's public key. Okay, so because okay, because they're all they're all saying we know that Alice should get this yeah. and Alice is acting as as the master to, to determine. Yeah, it's basically uh, okay. we 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 in 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 New Cypher we come up with we usually prefer to name the, the entities, so we usually call her Alice. But she actually, from a more, you know, more specific uh, role, she is the data owner. So uh, producers know have to know the uh, key, the public key of the data owner. So then it could be, it could be hopefully not so bad that when the left hand side is a fleet of like devices out in the world, and you do key locations from time to time, they yeah. change the destination and. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was actually, well, yeah, I didn't want to come into a lot of details about it, but uh, we actually don't have like a single uh, public key for Alice. We have many of them where they can actually be labeled. Mm -hmm. So Alice can create many labeled public keys, encrypting public keys, and data producers can use, you know, depending on, on the application. We'll see that during the walkthrough demo, we get that. Yeah. If we have time, I, I hope we have, we have time to show you the demo. Uh, because, yeah, I'm going to talk about the serial number stuff, but after that, if we, ha if we have time, I think we will really, you, should, you will really benefit from seeing the demo. Okay, I know proxy encryption is, can be confusing, so please ask me whatever we want. I really prefer that proxy encryption and how new cipher works is clear, rather than the serial number stuff, because you know, it's, it's more advanced and, and uh, I think it's probably uh, in the best interest for you. Okay, so now that you know what proxy encryption is, then what we are building is the new cipher network. We usually call it just new cipher, but just to don't get confused between the company and the project, sometimes we will say also new cipher network. So what is the new cipher network? It's basically now that you already know what this proxy encryption concept is, the Cypher Network is a service that is performing this proxy encryption um, uh, functionality, but as a service, and on top of that, in a decentralized way. So this is the f very first application of decentralization and proxy encryption. And yeah, we actually are very proud of it. So um, basically, the, the idea is the, of Data owners, or who we call Alice, can create access policies and send these policies to the network. These policies basically contain uh, re uh, what we call re-encryption keys, okay? And the idea is that the nodes on the network in a decentralized way will perform re-encryption as a service whenever they are requested by uh, intended data consumers, right? So. You can see that the encryption process is a way to enforce access policy because if the nodes perform a encryption and you have the private key that was authorized by Alice in the first place, then you will get the content. So it's basically in a way doing some enforcement of an access delegation decision. Yeah, this is just to show you that uh, we have many uh, use cases already for NoCypher. So we have, all of them are basically trying to solve some data sharing need, but in different scenarios. We have medical uh, platforms, we have key management, we have Internet of Things, we have uh, decentralized databases, but the common denominator of everything is that they need some kind of data sharing of confidential data, and um, they want it to be decentralized, and NuCypher is the, the platform, the, the best platform to do that. Yeah, okay, so getting a little bit more into the details of how, uh, what, what we do is, uh, we're going to talk about our proxy encryption scheme. So we have come up with a, um, a special proxy encryption scheme, which is, uh, a threshold proxy encryption scheme. What does this mean? Basically, this means that it works in a distributed way, so it's perfect for, for this kind of decentralized solution. 
So basically, instead of having for, I told you about encryption keys and I just told you about one proxy that gets one encryption key for Alice to Bob. But imagine that instead of having one proxy, you have 20 proxies and you split the key between the 20 of them and then for the, for the consumer to, to get the content, they have to you know, get uh, their encryption from several of these proxies. Like, kind of, in, I don't know if you are familiar with Shamir's secret threading. It's kind of, it's, it's similar, I mean, it's similar because it's, it's, it specifically uses Shamir's secret threading. So it's a way to defeat any kind of central or single point of failure. So we have a decentralized platform who is performing re-encryption and if at least certain number of nodes are benign and are collaborating, the content, the consumers will get their content. Um, yeah, so there are also some properties from the proxy encryption perspective. Our scheme is unidirectional, which means that access policies only work one way. So when Alice delegates to Bob, it, that doesn't mean that Bob is also delegating to Alice. I comment that because some proxy encryption schemes are bidirectional, so ours is not, uh, which is good. Um, Single hop, which means that once a proxy transforms a ciphertext to Bob, that ciphertext cannot be transformed again, basically. So this is also interesting because this is this this allows you know any kind of potential um, access delegation chains that maybe Alice is completely unaware. So that's also all good. Also interesting properties. This is non-interactive. From the proxy encryption perspective, not interactive means that Alice doesn't, know, doesn't have to interact with consumers. Alice only have to know the public of the consumers that uh, the public can be, I don't know, it can be in, a, in the blockchain, they can be in, in a, any, uh, how do you call it, a bulletin board or whatever. It doesn't matter, it's a public key. They, uh, Alice doesn't only need the public of the consumers. And one of the cool features of our scheme that I didn't mention that it's called umbral. Umbral is Spanish word for threshold. So uh, one of the cool features of, of umbral is that it uses zero knowledge proofs to guarantee that the nodes, that the proxies are actually doing their job in a correct way. So yeah. So. We already implemented this. Everything is uh, fully implemented. You can download it. Uh, our reference implementation is written in Python, so it's called PyOmbral. And it actually, under the hood, it uses cryptography IO, which in turn uses OpenSSL, because we use uh, elliptical cryptography. And you can play with it. We are more than happy for uh, if you download it, play with it. It's uh, on PyPy already. You can also check out the source code and everything. Please uh, have a look at it. We will be very happy if you, if you do. And OK, so diving in a little bit into the zero knowledge proof stuff. So I don't know what time is it, because I also want to the demo. OK. So the, how, do, how do we perform these proofs of encryption? So we use, this is the, the first application of zero knowledge proof that we, that I am aware of uh, proxy of yeah, zero knowledge proof to proxy encryption to actually demonstrate correctness of the process. In, under the hood we use kind of a simple uh, method which is a zero knowledge proof of discrete algorithm equality which has been known for 25 years or so. And uh, since we, ha we want a non-interactive uh, protocol, we are using the fiat semi heuristic to make it, it non-interactive. Um, and it's secure in the, as long as the random Oracle model is secure, which is, I think, is a, a fine assumption. And uh, what we can achieve is that any re-encrypted ciphertext can have a proof attached to it. So, and this proof is publicly verifiable. So basically, new cipher nodes cannot cheat. They can, maybe they, 
don't maybe they can go offline but if they're online and if they are producing re encryptions they can just produce garbage because one concern we could have with you know dealing with um, decentralized platform that operates on encrypted data is what if the nodes are just opening garbage how are you going to check if they are opening just garbage just random garbage instead of doing actual um, you know correct work so since we have this that concern is gone so yeah this is just a um, uh, really simple um, no not, not simple a really brief overview of how we produce the proofs this is a standard uh, snore like uh, proof of proof of knowledge basically what we do is we uh, we take the ciphertext I'm not going to really explain it, but we take the, the original ciphertext, we take the, 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 the share of the encryption key, and, and the node performs a, a, a zero knowledge proof using this, which can be verified publicly in a very easy way. So basically, this proof can be verified with, with three very simple equations, which actually only use elit uh, simple elliptic curve arithmetic. So actually, the proof takes information from the ciphertext. Uh, the proof, no, the verification process just takes information from the ciphertext, information from the proof, and information from the re-encrypted ciphertext, performs some scalar multiplications on, on, on top of it, and it's done. So from the um, protocol, no, not the protocol, from the client application perspective, we do this in Python all the time. It's very fast for a CPU to do it, so it's not a concern. The cool thing is that we thought, what about if we do this in the smart contract? So if we have a smart contract that can actually take encrypted ciphertext and proofs and you know, uh, check if they are correct or not, then we can have a very cool feature, uh, a very cool method to publicly uh, guarantee correctness of a protocol. But the problem is that Solidity has, doesn't have a really uh, support for elliptic curve cryptography arithmetic. So we built an arithmetic library, uh, ECC arithmetic library in Solidity with you know, some optimized formulas and stuff. And it's online, you can check it. Uh, it actually, it's very fast for doing the kind of operation that we want, which is verifying pub public, public proofs. Uh, so equations of that form that with other uh, ECC libraries for Solidity may take, may take millions of gas units. This takes, okay, 500K, which is not that, which is not that bad. Uh, yeah, perhaps I'm not going to go into the details about the uh, ECC arithmetic library, just mentioning that, of course, is, since this is going to be executed by a smart contract in a public platform, don't use this library with any private data. It's just for checking, for example, zero knowledge proof that can be publicly verifiable. Uh, yeah, this is very detailed. Yeah, so in, in the end, our proofs are all in the, in the form that I mentioned before. And overall, our protocol can verify, uh, a smart contract can verify new cipher proofs uh, with less than 1.3 million of, of gas units, which is really interesting. And uh, although it's kind of heavy, it can be done and it can be used as part of, of our protocol for maintaining the network uh, honest and correct. So, yeah, you, you can have a lot of information about what we're doing. We, all, we have all our development in the public. We have, uh, in, in GitHub, you can find several repos. Uh, we have, for, related to this talk, we have mainly three of them. Nucypher, which is our main application. Payumba, which is the proxy encryption uh, library. And Numerology, which is the uh, elliptic arithmetic library for Solidity. So it would be great if you can check it out and tell us what you think about it. Uh, we are all, all the time in Discord. And I don't know if you have questions, but uh, if there's time and you still want to know a little bit about what we're doing, um, 
we can show you a little demo if you if you are interested. Uh, is that okay to you? Yeah.